Baseball isn't just numbers, numbers, numbers. This game is not being played on computers. You don't do that with a bunch of statistical gimmicks. You don't put a team together with a computer. Pure. We're talking weighted runs created plus. Expected Woba. His sweet spot rate. Defensive runs above average. Average exit velocity. Barrel rate. XFIP. BABIP. S-I-E-R-A. We are above replacement radio. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio, where we're talking baseball kind of whenever. I'm your host, Chris Gianta. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Kern. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I'm doing very well today. As always, uh, we have reached the world, we've made it to the end of the championship series. Uh, you know, we were kind of, I don't want to say dreading talking about the games last time, but we came into last recording being like, well, we got some games to talk about. Some of them were good. Not really. But we got some great games uh, to talk about pretty much across the board, uh, I would say, in terms of what happened on the field, but also in terms of stuff that we took away from them that we could uh, highlight for you on a stat sheet. And that's what we got here today. We got four games to talk about. We have two series to recap and we have one series to preview. And it's the World Series that everyone wanted, too, which is awesome. Yeah, it's it's lovely. Like you got two just underdogs who who mm-hmm. you know just have not been around uh in this series very much um mm-hmm. it's it's very similar to last year it's like uh it's chris have you seen the movie moneyball um yeah yeah i did i, I it's kind, I it's kind it. of like that right yeah exactly exactly yeah. like it would it would make sense to like you know put the money put the theme of the mon- of the mm-hmm. movie moneyball and put it over you know, one of these teams while they're facing someone with a third of their, a third of their payroll. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's, I mean, that's exactly like when I was, when Juan Soto hit that home run in game five, I was like, wow, this is just like when, (laughs) when, uh, had a burke hit that home run. Yeah. I was like one for the little guy. I mean, come on, right. Um, yeah, yeah, no, (laughs) it's off of, off of Hunter Gaddis. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. I mean, the big bad Hunter Gaddis, as they say. And little Juan Soto, you know, out of nowhere, really. Yeah, just uh, just real, you know, blue collar teams going out there. Um, but not to discredit them, but yeah, the the money ball thing that was that was extreme. That was it's going more over just a shot at people on the internet than it is the teams themselves. Yeah, like, teams are fine. The one the one takeaway that I have with this series, like I know that people hate the idea of a Dodgers Yankees World Series because it's boring and predictable, and Like, I don't know, I kind of appreciate that at least for this year, we will have a team win the World Series that spends a lot of money because I think it's important to at least sometimes, maybe not all the time, but at least sometimes have that reminder of like, hey, by the way, if you pay a lot of money for your team, uh, that puts you in a better position. Oh, yeah, for sure. That's a point I want to get into, Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the Yankees Guardian series later. um, Yes. Because, yeah, I mean... uh, there's a there's a clear correlation and it's just kind of frustrating knowing, you know, what is limiting, you know, certain teams like, you know, these AL Central teams specifically, um, you know, they're they're good enough. You know, they have whatever internally that's good enough to get them to the spot, but just not enough talent to completely finish it off. And I mean, that's why, yeah, it's been it's been uh, nine years since we've seen like an AL Central team win the World yeah. Series. And that was that was the last smaller the first- team to win a world series. Yep. I mean, this year was the first time we've even had an AL central team in the ALCS since 2016. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's been, been the ridiculous. Astros versus, well, not, uh, not always an AL East team. It's been the Astros versus someone from the East or West every year. Yeah, mostly exactly. The East. Yeah. Mostly the East. Yeah. Whether it be Rays, Yankees, Red Sox, and then one year, uh, the Rangers. Um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, so, um, so yeah, we got to talk about the ALCS and uh, and what happened there. That was the first series to conclude um, as it mm-hmm. only went five games. However, uh, that is not to say that it was not a uh, competitive series because, uh, because it was. I mean, definitely the last three games uh, really could have gone in either direction. All classics. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so. So, yeah, uh, game four, uh, Yankees get out on top. Um, first uh, in the first inning uh, with a Juan Soto two run home run that added 16% win, win probability added uh, for the Yankees. 
uh, and that was after a leadoff single by Glaber Torres. Um, and the teams kind of go back and forth. Uh, it eventually gets to three to two, and then John Carlos Stanton uh, with another momentous home run, uh, which he's seemed to have uh, a lot of times throughout um, his time with the Yankees in the postseason. Um, that three run homer uh, went uh, flipped the score from three to two to six to two and added another 16% of win probability added for the Yankees. Uh, however, uh, the Guardians start coming back um, t- in the seventh inning. Uh, they start stacking some runners on base. Uh, they're doing it against Clay Holmes. Uh, Jose Ramirez and Josh Naylor have back-to-back doubles in that seventh inning. Uh, that combines for 28% win probability added. Uh, and then in the eighth inning, uh, runner gets on, makes it to third. Uh, there's two out. And then there's a weird, a weird play that's called a single. I think it's yeah. been, should have, that, been that, that should have been an error. Yeah, it, it seemed very much like an like, error. It was definitely not an easy play, especially for Rizzo, but like that's the come on, that's not a hit. Yeah, the the pitcher bobbled it a little bit. Uh he mm-hmm. tossed it to Rizzo, who did not make the catch. Run scores, ties it six to six, and adds a 31% uh win probability added for the uh for the guardians uh and then emmanuel classe comes in for the guardians um he unfortunately allows a lot of line drives uh the yankees had three batted balls between 11 and 15 degrees in the ninth inning uh, and that helped them score two runs uh those batted balls uh in that in those areas uh counted for three singles and a 667 average expected batting average uh and anthony rizzo uh started that rally uh, and eventually Anthony Volpe and Glaber Torres uh, added to that. So yeah, Yankees score two in the ninth and and shut the door. But yeah, I mean, what were your thoughts on uh, on game four? Yeah, I mean, this game was a pendulum, right? I mean, it started, you know, the Yankees were up six to two. The Guardians came back. And I believe at one point in the eighth inning, after that, uh, that David Fry quote unquote single, they had, you know, a couple runners on and two outs and uh, oh, well, they had a guy on second and two outs. And I believe uh, the TBS data cast, which I was watching that night, had the Guardians at a 58.8% win percentage. So, I mean, like they were kind of knocking on the door of tying up this series and just, you know, how quickly things change. And then things got away from them. He was giving up some uh, unfortunate contact. Uh, the one biggest takeaway that I had from this game came with the a uh, three-run home run by John Carlos Stanton. Uh, this was off of Cade Smith. And I just, I don't know, like I had a lot of questioning with the way that this at-bat was uh, sequenced, so to speak. So uh, Cade Smith, you know, he's he's pitched in a lot of games this postseason. And uh, I think he looked a little maybe gassed, you know, kind of going towards the end there. Maybe that was just the Yankees getting to him. I'm not sure. But uh, it was the third time that he had faced Stanton in the series. He had faced him in games one and uh, two, I believe. Uh, Or no, it was uh, games, sorry, it was games two and three. Um, But the thing that, one thing that people have been talking about this postseason is that, you know, we know the third time through the order with the starting pitcher, but third time seeing a reliever in a series is actually a kind of a thing as well. It was Stanton's third time seeing Smith. And I don't blame, uh, you know, there was a whole controversy of do you pitch Stanton here because first base was open with one out. Um, and, you know, I don't think anyone's questioning Kate Smith or the Guardians if they do walk John, John Carlos Stanton in this situation. Uh, but they but they went for him, and I, I respected that. Kate Smith's a very good pitcher. So he gets a first pitch called strike on a four-seamer up in the zone. It's a swing strike on another four-seamer up in the zone. And at this point, it's 0-2. Uh, by the way, Smith has, between the three at-bats to this point, Smith had thrown a first-pitch sweeper to Giancarlo, the first pitch, the first at-bat that they had, and only thrown four-seam fastballs from there on out. So I believe that at that point it had been seven straight fastballs, six straight fastballs uh, between the, the at-bats. And, you know, anyone who's watched Giancarlo Stanton knows, I say this, you know, a little bit lightheartedly, but with a tad bit of seriousness to it that, you know, He's never seen a, an 0-2 breaking ball in the dirt that he doesn't like, right? And that's, you know, when you have an 0-2, that's just kind of what you do. You give, you bury something, you see if you can get a chase. If not, you keep going there. Uh, but Kate Smith opted to continue throwing John Carlos Stanton fastballs high and in or just high in the zone in general. And I just didn't understand this because, you know, I think if you give John Carlos Stanton enough fastballs in relatively the same spot, 
he's going to he's going to get on it eventually. And that's exactly what he did here. So I just didn't understand the sequencing on that one uh, going with the same pitch four times in a row in that at bat. And it, it you know, it hurt them, obviously. And that's a big difference maker because it's three runs in that game. Um, was did he he got him on a he got him on a fastball that was was it low and away? Was no, it, all of them were high. Oh, maybe that was a different home John Carlos Stanton home run. He I'm did talking about the game four one. Um. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. I, I think it's just I think Stanton does have a pretty rough weakness um with fastballs up in the zone at least th- those types of hitters who. Hit a it's lot not of fly a, yeah, balls. but it's the fact that he threw it four times in a row. Yeah, I think I I do think you know obviously you have to mix things in. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe it was just a mistake of attacking the weakness too much and you know kind of uh, um, you know showing your cards a little bit too much. So yeah, I mean you know throwing six straight fastballs sometimes, yeah, sometimes that might not work. Um, so the the home run was the eighth straight fastball. Okay, yeah, eighth straight fastball. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it's very interesting. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, if there's one person that's earned the right, it's Cade Smith. I mean, you see that he led all pitchers in run value on a four-seamer as a reliever, which is remarkable. But, I mean, 0-2 to Stanton, you know, you got to put at least one breaking ball down in the zone. Yeah, right, right, right. Or at least something that uh, is not really that hittable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just uh, looking at, looking at, any and all stats yeah his, yeah I, I think they were just probably trying to attack a weakness but but just repeating too much on pitch selection mm-hmm. um so yeah no, I, I believe that too i just you know i think you gotta you, you gotta maybe not throw something four times in a row <laughs> yeah exactly exactly um yeah so so yeah that's um that's what happened with uh with that game um you know yeah that was my that was my biggest takeaway from that from that game yeah yeah as, it, it, as it, lame and nerdy as it sounds yeah i mean it proved it proved to be a very pivotal moment and obviously um much of these much of these games and and these critical games rely on um leaving guys on base and you know not allowing the big the big home run um especially with runners on base and you know there there's a pivotal moment and there was definitely some you know questionable pitch selection there uh against a very dangerous hitter um so yeah the uh yankees win ultimately um i think they definitely deserve to win that game oh yeah guardians it it would have been you know if the guardians ended up winning that would would have been an obvious you know yankees slip up a a game they should have won um and then we go on to game five uh there you know there was a wasn't um wasn't a whole lot i really remember too much uh that didn't happen in, in extra innings, to be honest. Um, yeah. They, you know, they each scored two runs in, uh, in regulation. Um, ultimately Juan Soto, uh, hits a three run home run with two outs, I believe. Right. Yes, it was. Yeah. Three run yep. home run, two outs in the top of the 10th. Um, and that was the most win probability added on a Yankees playoff play since 2012. Was um, that Raul Ibanez? That was Ra- Raul Ibanez. Has to be, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what? A, yeah. I mean, like, I, I, we, I feel like we need to just talk about the at-bat as a whole because, I don't know, like, it just, you know, like, there are certain hitters in certain spots where you see someone in the box and you're just trying to imagine a scenario where they make an out and you just don't see it play in your mind. And that was what I was feeling with Soto there, right? Like, he got him... He got him to two strikes. Uh, remarkably, he had a one-two after like six pitches. He just kept fouling stuff off, uh, and it felt like, you know, it was only a matter of time until he he barreled something up, and he did it. Yep, he did it. He did it. He did it. Juan yeah. Soto has <laughs> it is <laughs> third home run of the series. Yeah, it was uh, a seven pitch at bat, and everything was. Um, if not in the zone, very close to the zone. So mm-hmm. um, not giving it any waste pitches necessarily. Uh, and, you know, the pitch that Soto did hit out of the park, it, I think it was actually technically out of the zone. Um, but uh, It was. Yeah, it was like above, it was like at his head. Yeah, and that it was the first 
four seam fastball he had seen um of the entire at bat so yeah pretty crazy um yeah. yeah just very on top of it um was maybe probably was looking for it found it um and took it to center field for or center field or right center field for the for the home center run field yeah i don't even know what you're supposed to do if you're hunter gaddis in that spot like i don't know like i guess the, the in hindsight the move was walk him and, and take your chances with judge yeah po- very possibly very <laughs> which possibly. is just such a crazy thing to say but that's just how good soto has been these playoffs indeed indeed yeah um so yeah Juan soto comes up with the big play and yeah the most win probability added on a yankees playoff play since 2012 and that's saying something because i believe this is the ninth time that the yankees have been to the playoffs um since then so to the fact that this is the you know most impactful play the yankees have seen in a, in a postseason game um in their last nine times of being yeah. in the playoffs uh yeah i mean it's it definitely says something and um is part of the reason why they are in this situation now you know being in their first world series in 15 years um where does it uh it's probably it has to be the largest championship win probability added since 2009 right um no i would imagine I think so i think really when i went when i went through it there was not it was pretty di- low down the list and i think it's because it's it was game five and and they were leading not game seven it. yeah like they were leading three games yeah that the... makes sense because they were already expected to go to the world series regardless right yeah and Unf- i was that's because that's what i looked up first um mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, it was kind of a dud, kind of a dud of a search. Um, but uh, throughout the series, um, you could say there was there was definitely a solid argument for Juan Soto to be the ALCS MVP. Um, he ended up hitting 368 with a 1373 OPS, uh, hit three home runs, six RBI, had a 101.4 mile per hour average exit velocity. 31% barrel rate and led the team, uh, led all players in win probability added with 0.81. Uh, John Carlos Stanton ended up winning ALCS MVP, and I don't think there's really much of a wrong answer between Soto and Stanton. He hit 222 with a 1222 OPS, four home runs, seven RBI, 98.2 mile per hour average exit velocity, 39% barrel rate, and 0.60 win probability added. Uh, Anthony Rizzo added a 429 batting average and 1000 OPS with a 55% line drive rate. So that 429 batting average is fairly well earned. And uh, Anthony Volpe was also doing well, um, you know, getting base hits. Hit He hit uh, 353 with an 888 OPS, 19% walk rate, uh, and 50% line drive rate. On the pitching side of things, Carlos Rodon um, had two starts throughout the series with 10 and two thirds innings pitched a two, five, three ERA 37% strikeout rate, 2% walk rate, one, eight, five FIP and had 28% of batted balls above 45 degrees. Um, 2024 league average was 13%. He was at 28%. And, uh, why that is significant is, you know, any batted ball above 45 degrees is fairly non-competitive. Uh, and that was proven with the guardians going 0 for seven on such batted balls. So, um, a lot of key performers for the Yankees, and I think fairly representative, a lot of um, players that have been acquired, uh, you know, and not necessarily um, homegrown. These are, you know, Cashman mm-hmm. and Steinbrenner additions for the most part. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Rodon, like, I feel like people kind of just forgot about him and what he was expected to be when he became a Yankee because he just really hasn't lived up to it. But like, this is, I mean, this, he's been the moment, you know, in these last two starts, I know that, uh, that, that Royal start got away from him a little bit, but I mean, that contract looks pretty good right now. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, if, if, uh, you know, if you were to put me in uh, one of those, whatever, Dr. Strange portals and, uh, yeah. and you know, it's, you know, it's uh, December of 2022 and the Yankees have just signed him and you put me in a, uh, October of uh of 2024, 2024 here and and you're showing me Rodon stats from the series I'm like that makes a whole lot of sense and this mm-hmm. is why I hated this is why I hated the Yank that the Yankees were able to sign him um for you know six years 162 um it's just yeah he's had a lot of road road uh speed bumps along the way but ultimately he is you know getting it done when the Yankees need him most 
Um, so good for good for him. Um, with the uh, with the Cleveland Guardians, they had some solid performance as well. Um, definitely on the offensive side, which was something that kind of surprised me. Uh, Kyle Manzardo, uh, although in a fairly limited amount of plate appearances, but you know I think around fifteen or or between like twelve and fifteen, he hit three eighty five with a ten seventy seven OPS uh, throughout the series. David Fry continued perform with a three thirty three batting average and nine sixty eight OPS, and uh, John Kenzie Noel. I uh, also hit two with, with a 958 OPS um, where the guardians struggled, where they had not usually struggled was their bullpen. Um, although they had a three, eight, six ERA, their peripherals uh, dragged them down a bit. They had a five, three, five FIP along with a 13% walk rate and 1.9 home runs per nine. Uh, so they were definitely uh, putting guys on and, and allowing the big hits Um you know, allowing the big homers uh, more frequently than they usually do. Uh, you know, Emmanuel Classe's, um, you know, lack of good performance uh, was was definitely pointed out by a lot of people. He ended up going two and a third with a fifth, two and a third innings pitch with a fifteen forty three ERA and thirteen point eight eight FIP. Uh, you know, walked some guys, allowed a, a good amount of homers, um, or allowed two homers, which you know, in two and a third innings it is a lot. Um, also, Emmanuel Classe, this is something you pointed out uh, on Twitter. His Emmanuel mm-hmm. Classe's line drive percent uh, went from 24% in the regular season to 27.6% in the postseason. And average exit velocity against went from 88.4 miles per hour to 94.4 miles per hour. So, yeah, and that's on those per- line drives. Yeah, six mile per hour difference um, on, on, is it, was it six mile online per drives? Yeah, yeah, six mile per hour difference online drives it makes a huge difference. Uh, that is a, you know that that's you know the difference between some of those turning into outs and some of those uh, being hits. Um, and then Cade Smith, uh, who we t- mentioned, gave up that Stanton home run. He went three and two thirds innings pitch with a seven three six ERA and five three five FIP. Um, w- one thing I wanted to say before we uh, before we um, move on if we were going to do that is you know guardians you know shout out to them they they pretty probably maximized their potential they did better yes. they you know they defied all expectations um we didn't even have them winning the uh lds either so they they broke through that however um they were getting beat by juan soto john carlos stanton carlos Rodon were the were the big pieces of that those were all those are all players we cannot imagine the Guardians having right now. So that's that's kind of where where they're limited. You know, you can you can have as great a farm system or great as great internal development as you can, but you're always going to be limited. And and unfortunately for the Guardians, they're limited by their owner, uh, and they're just never going to you know as long as that owner's there or as long as that um, as as long as that uh, I, you know ideology of the owner is is present this is what's probably going to continue happening um for forever and ever i mean just it's very consistent that you know these teams who you know go into the playoffs you know they can they can get there but it's been a trend over the last nine ten years that they typically are not able to finish it off because they just don't have enough talent to break through MLB trade rumors has the Dolan family listed uh, at being worth $4.6 billion in 2021 heading into 2022. They are actually like one of the richer owners in baseball. Are they Dodgers rich? No. Are they Yankees rich? No. And I'm not, you know, yeah, I'm not campaigning for them to go out and sign a Juan Soto or an Aaron Judge or a Giancarlo Stanton. But I mean, it's Jose Ramirez and what? It, you know, it's a bunch, it's Jose Ramirez and a bunch of younger guys who are interesting, but right now not enough to carry you over the finish line. And, you know, Ramirez himself didn't have a very good series, but, uh, you know, but you still need, you still need more. One thing I was thinking about this this week, I would love to know, uh, and I don't think there's any way of figuring this out because teams don't release this information publicly, but I would love to know like each team's revenue and like divide that by the payroll so like if we could have a if we could have like a calculation of like payroll divided by previous year's revenue i would love to see 
what the lead what those leaderboards look like because I feel like that can really tell us the actual like spending gap. And I know that there's obviously factors other than previous years rev- revenue that go into how, you know, teams budget what they put on the field. I'm well aware of that. So maybe this is a flawed way of thinking, but you know, I mean, we talk about like, Hey, the Dodgers and the A's, right. They're two franchises with very different, uh, you know, very different budgets. And yes, I'm, I agree that, you know, the Dodgers definitely have better resources and more money to spend than the A's. But I would imagine if you broke down, broke it down that way and you looked at the A's, uh, you know, payroll compared to their revenue, it would be a much less uh, ratio than the Dodgers. Right. So, I mean, if I say like, hey, I want the A's to spend like the Dodgers, I don't mean I want them to go out and put up a three hundred million dollar payroll. I mean, I want them to put that much of their revenue, let's say, on the field. And I would imagine they don't do that. I would imagine the Dodgers. Uh, you know, despite how high their payroll is, probably still rank in like the top five. If you were to put that metric out there, I would guess the Padres are probably number one. Uh, but I would imagine, you know, some of those rankings probably don't look very different. But Cleveland is a team I would imagine is probably towards the bottom. Right. And and by ratio, uh, you're talking toward bottom of ratio of payroll to um, previous year's revenue which you know mm-hmm. again maybe a flawed way of thinking because i'm well aware that once again there are other factors that go into how to budget team outside of that but i think that's you know certainly one way of putting things in perspective yeah absolutely and and by the way the you know in any normal situation the guardians don't even have jose ramirez because mm-hmm. he took you know yeah at, at the age of i think 28 uh having you know been an MVP finalist recently having gotten MVP votes uh, recently and and being one of the best players in the game uh, took a five-year $124 million contract. When I think really he hit the open market, he would have gotten probably around double that. Yeah. $200 million yeah. Uh, if not more. Um, and it just happened that he, he likes the familiarity. He likes being in, in Cleveland. Uh, and, and I don't think, you know, wanted to, you know, totally uh, just re, just uh, leave his life, you know, yeah. away from, you know, what he what he had grown used to. So yeah, the Guardians are even lucky to have him around. Never mind, you know. Uh, and so that is something to something to think about as well. But yeah, it's it's uh it's why and yeah, we're not we're not saying you know you got to be like the Yankees or Dodgers. However, um, you know, I don't looking at the Rangers last year like. Mm-hmm. If we talking about the Rangers back in like 2019, we wouldn't call them a big market team at all. Uh, and no. they, their owner just kind of took it upon his free will to be like, all right, well, I want to, I want to make this team better. Maybe it doesn't even make sense timing wise right now, but uh, I want to make this team better and, and invest in it. And it worked out. And, you know, Corey Seager ended up being a major factor. Mar- Marcus Simeon ended up being a major factor. And those were the two big signings they got. Um, so, yeah. And, uh, you know, the Guardians just don't have those players. They they only have they only really have what they what they develop on their own or or trade for. So it's uh, it's it's very unfortunate. And I think that's the thing that's that's holding them back and holding a lot of other teams back. So. MLB averages around $11 billion of revenue per year right now. And if you to like, I don't know, let's say divide that by 30 and you know, that that's running under the assumption that all teams make the same revenue, which is just not true. Right. Uh, but hypothetically that would mean the average team makes, uh, you know, about what, like three, three or wait, like 36 million probably. Right. Something like that. Um, $11 billion or no, wait, 360 million yeah 360 million yeah that's what i'm thinking of my math was was off there um so the dodgers have a you know a 325 million dollar payroll right like let's say and again this information is not public let's say that their revenue last year was i don't know it's probably was probably more than that um if it was like 500 million dollars or something like that right yeah if they spent if if the A spent that same at that same ratio, I would imagine their payroll would skyrocket. And that yeah. then I'm I'm calling it the A's here. It's not just the A's. It's plenty of others, but that's just the first one that comes to mind. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because 
you know, it in, I, you know, not that it's necessarily why you signed the guy, but like when the Dodgers signed Otani, they were able to, you know, sell a bunch of Otani jerseys. So mm -hmm. it's not fully just, you know, you give that person the money and, and then, you know, you don't get it. You don't get anything out of that. There's <laughs> right. It's why it's called an investment. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's kind of a reminder of, of what that's all about. And even, even in Moneyball, you know, the, the a, it ends with the A's losing in the ALDS. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's kind of, um, that kind of symbolizes what, what goes on in baseball. Typically uh, it's very rare that the, that the little guy is able to win in the end. Um, it seems there is, there is exactly one team since Moneyball that was, has like in any capacity, like sort of replicated the A's model and won the world series with it. And I'm talking about the 2015 Royals, uh, which even then doesn't exactly work, but multiple other teams have tried to replicate that Royals team and have failed drastically and haven't been relevant for several years. Most notably the White Sox and the Pod or the, not the Padres, the Rockies. Right. Right. And, and, you know, but the Royals, they had the benefit of, of being a very poor team for a while and able to, were able and to yeah, get it took, it took the Royals 30 years of not making the playoffs to get to that point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They missed the playoffs from 1986 to 2013 every year. Right. And, you know, Moustakis was, I think, a second overall pick or something like that. I think Hosmer was a very high draft pick. Um, you know, they were able to get a lot of good prospects, partially because they had some high spots in the draft, um, which is, you know, which will happen. But um, not every team has that benefit and less teams are going to have that benefit now that the lottery is happening. So it's not something to really that's definitely not something to model off of for sure. No, 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 no. Um. And yeah, and this is obviously no discredit to teams like the Yankees. This is how ownership groups should be. Um, mm -hmm. They should be aggressive in, in making their team better. Um, I'm sure, you know, not every team has the exact resources that the Yankees have, but the gap is probably not as wide as as some owners want to make it seem to be. And yeah, I, I wish the I wish the Red Sox shared that. You know, Red Sox ownership. Yeah, that I mean, I would love to, if, that metric that I mentioned. I would love to see where the Red Sox ranked in, say, 2018 versus now. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure they probably made more revenue in 2018 than they do now, but uh, I would still imagine that they've fallen in whatever rankings those would be. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think if they shared that same enthusiasm, they may have been able to play against the Yankees in that series. Um, potentially they were not too far off, you know, they were probably a couple of players away. Um, so yeah. Um, anything more on the, uh, Yankees guardian series? No, I think that's uh, all I had. It was, uh, I mean, game, you know, I, I had Yankees in four, you had Yankees in six. We, we kind of split the difference there. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a couple games there was definitely, that, that definitely could have swung both ways. And the Guardians got one of those, the Yankees got two. Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, I think, I think it would be consensus that Yankees definitely outplayed the Guardians, but this, this one probably could have gone a little bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. if the, if the guardians came up on some more opportunities, um, all right, well, um, so yeah, the, uh, Yankees are in the world series. They will be facing the Dodgers, um, the yeah. Dodgers who did not, um, take it in five. They could have, no, I'll, uh, not. I'll take game yeah. five here because I had a lot of the notes on this one. There's so a lot of, a lot of stuff to get First into. First of all, I mean, this was such a offensively driven series, uh, the winning team in the NLCS scored at least at least seven runs in each game. Yeah, yeah. Which you know that's that's a lot of runs scored. Um, this one was a a Mets beatdown, uh, or well, a, a beatdown handed down by the Mets on the Dodgers, I suppose. Uh, the Mets scored three in the first inning on a Pete Alonso three run home run to dead center. They went on to score five in the third, two in the fourth. Uh, it was a eight to eight to one game after three, a ten to two game. Uh, after four, Dodgers did claw back, but it wasn't enough. The Do the Mets won this one, uh, twelve to six, uh, much like a a curveball. But uh, <laughs> but uh, there was a lot of takeaways from this one, and uh, you know, just to simply put it, uh, the Mets hit the ball hard. They crushed it, right? But to put it in some actual numbers, uh, the Mets had ten hard hit balls in the first three innings, which means ball at least ninety five miles per hour. That is the most hard hit balls they've had in the first three innings of any game all year. And it came when they were facing elimination in this, in this game at city field. 
Uh, as for the Dodgers, this was just the second time in the wild in the uh, in the Statcast era since 2015 that they've allowed 10 hard hit balls in the first three innings of the game. Ironically, the other time was also a postseason game. It was the game one of the 2023 National League Division Series against Arizona. That was the game when the Diamondbacks scored, I think, seven in the first inning, three more in the second. Uh, so amazingly, in nine years, the Dodgers have never done this in the regular season. They've done it twice in the postseason. And unfortunately, Jack Flaherty had to be the guy on uh, the low end of that. And there was a lot going on with Jack Flaherty based on what we were seeing with the uh, the StatCast numbers his four-seam fastball, which is usually his most used pitch, had a 91.4 mile per hour average velocity. That was the fourth lowest in any appearance that he has had throughout his career, which goes back to 2017. And it was the lowest he's had in any start since April 1st of 2023. So uh, the, you know, Jack Flaherty was throwing the fastball, but it was slower than almost any start he's ever made. Uh, additionally, his slider is usually his second most used pitch, but uh, he only used it 18.7% of the time. That was the lowest of any game uh, in 2024. Uh, and the reason he didn't throw his slider a lot was because it wasn't very good. Uh, he had it pretty far out of the strike zone a lot of the time, far enough to where you weren't even really getting a chase on it. But also when he wasn't, uh, you know, when he was leaving it over the plate, he was giving up, say, that home run to Pete Alonso. He was giving up a lot of hard contact. His slider had a negative 32.5 run value per 100, which means based on the results he got on his slider, uh, if you put that on a per 100 pitch basis, he was giving up uh, 32 and a half runs. And that's the second worst that he's ever had on his slider in any game of his career, with the worst one being a game where he threw exactly one slider. So in terms of any meaningful sample size, it was the worst game Jack Flaherty has ever had with his slider uh, on top of already not having the velocity on his fastball. Uh, this caused him to use his curveball 40% of the time which is the highest he's had in any start in his career, um, which the curveball was fine. He only gave up one hit. It did happen to be a ground ball triple, but, uh, you know, given how much he had to use a pitch, he doesn't u- normally use a lot. He did fine with that, but, you know, obviously it was not a very good outing. As for the Mets, uh, they became the first team in postseason history with 12 runs scored and zero strikeouts in a game. Uh, they're the first team to do this in any game since the 2016 Blue Jays. And it's the second time that they've done this as a franchise in any game. The first time they did it was on August 28th of 1964. So it's been that long since the Mets have had a game like that. The Mets also had a 362 expected batting average on the night. That was the 10th highest of any team in a playoff game since 2015. Additionally, 39.4% of all swings the Mets took resulted in squared up batted balls, which means that, uh, between bat speed and pitch speed, the average the exit velocity was 80% of the maximum potential. Uh, 39% of in batted balls that were squared up. That's the highest the Mets have had in any game this year. And as for the Dodgers, uh, 40% of their batted balls were hit 40 degrees or higher, which as Chris mentioned earlier, usually is very uncompetitive. That's tied for the sixth highest any team has had in a postseason game since 2015. So... Uh, a lot going on in the stat sheet in this game. Uh, you know, it's it was a lot more uh, under the surface than just the simple Mets blowout. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and uh, and yeah, I guess I guess the tale of two Flaherty's in this series. You know, obviously mm-hmm. seven shutout innings in the uh, in game one, and then uh, and then yeah, just kind of a disaster class in game three. Um, however, yeah, I guess. In game one, there were some underlying things with Flaherty. There were some, you know, there was there was a little bit of a bad bippery, although mm-hmm. overall it was still a very good start. He, you know, if he should have allowed any runs, it, it would have only been a couple. Um, but but yeah, I mean, uh, just a completely different start in game in game five. Um, and yeah, it, I think um, I think this definitely shifted the mood of the series. I mean, obviously, anytime um, a big win happens like this, it will. But um, it kind of it kind of almost turned um, advantage Mets a little bit because, you know, we knew that the next game was going to be a Dodgers bullpen game. And when they when they had that game uh, those mm-hmm. fights, or when they had a game up to that point in that series, uh, th- that was the other Mets win. So uh, it seemed like, you know, the Mets actually had a shot in the series um, when it was going back to L.A. Yeah, it did feel like that. I mean, Minaya pitched very well in. uh in game two, but unfortunately it was not the same fortune in game six. Um, 
this was game six was another game that was just kind of you know over before it started well not over before it started because the Mets did take a one nothing lead but it was six to one after three um and by that point uh you know the writing was was kind of on the wall the Mets uh you know despite all of the adversity they'd faced and this was just a little too insurmountable for them Sean Manaya in this game uh, had a 13.7% called strike and whiff rate on his changeup and sweeper combined, which are his two secondary pitches. Uh, those are the pitches that he gets a swing and miss on because his primary pitch is a sinker. And that 13.7% called strike and whiff rate on those two pitches was tied for the second lowest he has had in a game this season. Uh, the Dodgers had 19 plate appearances with runners in scoring position in this one. Uh, that is the third most that they've had in any postseason game since 2008, which, again, you know, that's saying something because the Dodgers have been to the postseason several times since 2008. Um, also, uh, like I mentioned, six runs scored by the Dodgers in the first three innings, a couple of those coming on some some big home runs. Um, and, uh, right, I mean, Teoscar hit one, Will Smith hit one, um, Tommy Edmund hit another one, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, is that who it was? Yeah, Tommy Edmund hit one in the third, Will Smith. Smith hit one. Did Tay Oscar hit one? I don't think he did, actually. Anyway, um, the Dodgers had a 10-11 uh, expected slugging through the first three innings of this game. That is the sixth highest for any team in the first three innings of any postseason game since 2015. So, you know, a lot, like I mentioned, you know, earlier, a lot of hitting in this series. It came down to you know, who got off to a fast start, who crushed the ball in game five. That was the Mets. In game six, it was the Dodgers. And you could pretty much say the same for whoever won the game in any uh, game this series. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Kind of a weird series is as, as yeah. There were. Um, I don't think there was there was a single save situation or a save situation no. that, that would have started in the ninth. I think the closest game was seven to three, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the Mets were up six to three in like the eighth. So I think there would have been a potential save situation there if it was. Uh, more than three outs however yeah if it was a uh, if it started in the in the ninth there were there were no safe situations um which is pretty wild uh mm-hmm. but yeah i mean still a, yeah it still ended up being a pretty fun series like fun baseball to watch uh high scoring stuff so um so yeah uh dodgers ultimately just kind of came out on top and and yeah i mean it showed they they showed why they got there, which is, is it's really their offense. Like you know, yeah. they have some good pitching, mm-hmm. um, they have some good bullpen, and and the fact that they've had four shutouts in the playoffs has been um, very surprising and very impressive. But ultimately, their offense has gotten them here, and um, and that's that's what ultimately won them the series. Yeah, I mean, people had a lot of questions about the Dodgers pitching heading into these playoffs and the depth that they had, especially in the rotation. But thankfully. Uh, you can actually just hit your way out of those those concerns if you're good enough, and that's exactly what they did. Because yeah, I mean the pitching wasn't fantastic in this series either. Like they met, they let the Mets score a lot of runs in some of these games, uh, but it didn't matter. Because uh, yeah, by the way, like I just can't get over like baseball has to be the only sport where you know one team can spend a billion dollars in one off season and create like the the closest thing that the sport has seen to a super team in a while with you know, three superstars plus the highest paid pitcher ever, uh, you know, just so much star power and Tommy Edmond wins NLCS MVP. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't really see that. It, that's not really happening in too many other sports for the most part. No. Rarely. Um, there's um, the only example I can think of is um, when the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. Malcolm Smith won Super Bowl MVP and he was just this random like linebacker who okay. was not part of he was not he was not a top 10 player on the team at all but sure. uh, he just happened to have a good game but Tommy had It's weird cuz didn't the, didn't the Seahawks like score a ton of points that game too Yeah well he's he scored a he scored a pick 6 I'm pretty sure Okay so that was part of it um, Sure but uh it's it's still a, just a weird way that that went down um and and yeah like but for the most part when you look at uh super bowl mvps it's mostly quarterbacks you know mm-hmm. mostly the best player on the team um so yeah seeing uh seeing you know in baseball yeah you have these random guys just pick it up like you know tommy edmund like go back to like jackie bradley jr mm-hmm. um you know uh howie kendrick yeah um delman young Cattell- steve pierce yeah oh yeah Cattell Marte. 
um, who was not the same Cattell. Not non the guy. Yeah. Yeah, now he would be, but yeah, yeah, Delman Young. Uh, I mean, David Freeze, perfect example. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. David Freeze was, you know, like a guy that you know <laughs> was inducted into his team's Hall of Fame, uh, which he declined, but um, <laughs> but he like. That's, I mean, David Freeze got inducted into a team's Hall of Fame, and you you could look at the baseball reference page and be like, wait, really? But everyone <laughs> knows why, and no one's questioning it. For sure, for sure. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Did, uh, did so, we... yeah, let's get into some of the numbers for this series. Uh, the Dodgers overall slash 268, 395, 459 for an 854 OPS over six games. Um, Tommy Edman was given – the NLCS MVP, like I mentioned, 407, 393. Gotta love the uh the higher batting average than OBP. Shout out to Flies. Yeah, reject walks. <laughs> uh 630 slug for a 1022 OPS, a 44% sweet spot rate. So uh, you know, that's why a lot of those hits were falling. Max Muncie probably had a very good case for MVP as well. 333, 630. Uh the the very opposite of what I just mentioned with Tommy Edmund. Uh, 733 for a 1363 OPS, a 13.2% chase rate, and a 27.3% barrel rate, um, which is awesome. Shohei Otani, uh, you've heard of him before, I think. Uh, 364, 548, 636 for an 1185 OPS, a 26.7% barrel rate, a 93.7 mile per hour average exit velocity. And this was a hot topic of conversation for the entire series and the entire playoffs, even spanning through the end of the regular season. Otani, with runners on base, 12 plate appearances. He slashed 571. That's a batting average. Uh, 750, 1,000 for a 1750 OPS per hour average exit velocity and a 40% barrel rate. He had five bad balls with runners on and two of them were barrels. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Boogie Betts broke out of his playoff slump in this series. Uh, 346, 452, 731 for an 1182 OPS. And those are some of the big hitters on the Dodgers. Overall, with runners in scoring position, the Dodgers hit 306 with a 556 slugging. As for the Mets, Jesse Winker played a platoon role, but when he did play, slashed 385, 579, 538 for an 1117 OPS. Francisco Alvarez also broke out of a playoff slump, 412, 476, 471 for a 947 OPS. And Francisco Lindor, uh, just for, for good measure, 292, 393, 500 for an 893 OPS. The Mets with abundance in scoring position hit 193 with a 333 slug. So that gets into uh, the last stat that I have. And I mean, this is, I think, the one. If you're trying to figure out what happened in this NLCS and what set the Dodgers over uh, the Mets, uh, here's a very deep way of looking at it. The Dodgers hit 11 home runs in this series. The Mets hit five. Why did that happen? Well, let's look at fly balls. The Mets had a 29.1% fly ball rate in this series. The Dodgers had a 27% fly ball rate. So the Mets had a slight advantage there. The Mets had a 93% or excuse me, a 93 mile per hour average exit velocity on fly balls, the Dodgers had a 94.2 mile per hour average exit velocity. So relatively similar uh, fly ball rates, relatively similar average exit below. However, the Mets hit 136 and slugged 477 on fly balls, while the Dodgers hit 302 and slugged 1093. So why the drastic difference? Well, that's because the Dodgers pulled 38.6% of their fly balls, while the Mets pulled 15.2%. We've talked all season about how most of your power is to the pull side. I know that you don't need numbers to understand that. But, I mean, if you want the difference, that kind of difference in pull rate, that led to a 25% home run to fly ball ratio for the Dodgers and a 10% for the Mets. Uh, so if you wanted to figure out where exactly we're in this series and the series driven by offense, the distribution of power by the Dodgers lapped the Mets. And that's that's why we're talking about the Dodgers in this situation. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it, uh, it is kind of a hack to, uh, to have success in um... – yeah, in in the fly ball department and whatnot is yeah, that that's just what you know what the what the stats say. You get better results when the, when the fly balls are pulled, um, usually because they are hit harder, so that does help as well. But mm -hmm. also, you know, you're hitting it to shorter distances of the ballpark, and um, it's more likely that uh, 
a ball going, you know, that uh, you can kind of have a little bit more control of holding a ball down the line than going opposite field down the line uh, to the shorter end of the ballpark. Um, and you're more likely to get more power when you're pulling it. So, um, yeah. so yeah, and and that obviously played, played a difference in this series. Mm -hmm. And you don't need numbers to understand that it's good to pull your fly balls. I think that kind of just goes without saying, if you think about it logically. But if you want numbers to show what kind of difference it makes, there it is. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not... It's not that disparate from what it looks like on a on a longer term scale um, mm -hmm. with entire league results. Uh, it's it's fairly similar. Um, so yeah, the uh, the the Dodgers take it in six. Um, we have the Yankees and Dodgers in the World Series, and I will say, like you know, obviously as a Red Sox fan, I I never really ever want to see the Yankees in the World Series. However. You know, people will kind of um, people who people will kind of I feel like no matter what World Series matchup, people will hate on it, whether it's too um, too irrelevant or too relevant, um, because we had people against the Rangers Diamondbacks uh, World Series last year. But I do think this, you know, this World Series is going to be cool. I mean, you look yeah. the two best players in baseball going to going against each other uh, and you have, you know, some other players that are considered top 10, top 20, top 30 players like Soto, Freeman, uh, Betts, um, in, you know, in how many players the on these teams were in our, in our, uh, top tens preseason. Yeah. I mean, I, know. I think for me, it's five, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, let's see. Aaron judge was one. Shoy Otani was two. Mookie Betts was four. Freddie Freeman was six. Juan Soto was seven. Yeah, so, <laughs> so five of the five of my preseason top seven players are all playing in this series. Right. Yeah. I mean that's, that's pretty cool. The fact that the fact that we get to see them on the literal biggest stage, I think I think mm -hmm. that's very good for baseball. Um and I think it will be fun to watch. No matter even if even if no one cared about it, I think it's just gonna be fun to watch anyway. Um yeah. just to see the two T, you know, the two teams with you know probably the best players out there um you know playing it for playing for the highest stakes and you know for some of these guys they're probably gonna you know get their first rings i feel like before we talk about this in full we should do a little in memoriam on the mets because this was a very fun team to watch it's one that i think uh most baseball fans that were tuned in will probably remember for a while right like the grimace run uh the uh, the crazy, you know, postseason comeback wins, even getting to the postseason in the first place, right? It took that ninth inning Lindor home run in Atlanta, which feels like so long ago now, but it was really like three weeks ago. Uh, you know, the Alonzo home run in uh, in Milwaukee, the Phillies, the Phillies games in New York, um, the eighth inning comeback in game one against the Phillies, and giving the Dodgers a run. I mean, this was a very fun team. Um, it's one that I think a lot of people would have been very down to see go all the way. Uh, that's just not how she wrote it though, but a uh, very fun team will be missed. Right. Right. And, and yeah, this was supposed to be a transition year for them. Um, yeah. Literally, literally by Steve Cohen's own words. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to Max Serger. Yeah. And, uh, and might I add, um, maybe I'm getting a little too uh, lost in the sauce of them, but I think this could be the start of, um, of a good journey for the Mets. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. they, are under you know new general management uh with david stearns yes yes before. um and i feel like some of the success um with the mets this year can can be attributed to stearns even though this was just his first year with the team um you know whether it be signings well, of, he ended up he ended up playing i would assume a much larger role than he probably anticipated because of the suspension that was handed to billy epler right right yeah yeah and uh yeah ended up um yeah signed signed Vinaya, um, signed some other members of the Iglesias. Rotation. Yeah. Jose Iglesias, you know, the yeah, everyone one. knew, I mean, when, when he signed that minor league deal that he was going to be a difference maker. Yeah. I mean, you know, Luis Severino signing ended up working. Um, so, and yeah, I think there's some internal stuff going on that can work out with the Mets that worked with the Brewers when David Stearns was there. Um, and also I just looked the, according to fan graphs, the Mets have the seventh best uh, farm su system in baseball. Yes. And then along with that, if that, you know, if those prospects don't work out, you have a guy that's willing to put, you know, any and all uh, financial uh, commitment to the team in Steve Cohen. So 
I think this uh, this might only be the start with the Mets. Um, and, you know, they they could find themselves back here very soon. The Serger and Verlander trades look so good right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they they do. They like to, to, I feel like most people forget at this point. Like, yeah, that was actually a thing. Like this time, eighteen months ago, the Mets were uh, rolling out a rotation with Justin Verlander and Max Serger, and it was being heralded as like the biggest thing going. Yeah. Um. Before they both got injured, but I mean, yeah, you get Drew Gilbert, you get Luis on Helicuña out of that. Like that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's pretty sick. Um, you know, very good development steps for Mark Vientes this year. Yes, my um, player to watch. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be that's definitely gonna be a hit. Um, and then yeah, I think we'll we'll definitely see more out of Francisco Alvarez. He's still only what twenty three right now. Yeah, um, I'm also so so happy that we can finally put any stupid narratives to rest about Francisco Lindor. Yeah, that that's that, my biggest that's... thing because. I mean, he's, I think, I would have to imagine going into this offseason, he's nationally going to finally start getting the respect he deserves. He's going to finish runner-up in MVP. Uh, people are going to talk about him as a, at bare minimum, top three shortstop in the game, which, you know, and maybe he'll make the all-star team next year. Very possibly. Yeah. Who, <laughs> who knows? knows? I don't want to dream too big here. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, this, yeah, this was a guy who, MLB Network ranked 25 and ESPN ranked 27. Mm -hmm. Um, And not that this is the end all be all, but he had the fourth most F4 in the previous two seasons um, in baseball. So, yeah, I think I think um, people are realizing that because he's you know, he was leading a winning team, um, even though it wasn't his fault that, you know, his team wasn't a winning team in 2023. um, You know, I think, uh, yeah, he will get a little bit more of the respect that he deserves. Which is which is always nice. Um, anything more on the Mets? No, I think uh, that's it for the uh, OMG Grimace Mets. Yeah, shout out, uh, shout out to them. I think, yeah, I, I do fully believe that um, this was not a uh, a one time thing for them. I think they'll. I hope not. Yeah, I think I think they can they can keep making noise. Um, but uh, but yeah, in regards to this series, uh, I. Th- I think this has the potential to be really fun. Um, you know, we we just yeah, there's just a lot of star power here. And yeah, I guess I guess it is uh, you know, the ultimate balance after the Rangers Diamondbacks played against each other last year. Um mm-hmm. for we, sure. It's yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. It it really is. Um but uh in terms of when they faced each other this year, it was uh, you know, a series back in Early June, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, Dodgers won the series two games to one and uh, outscored the in Yankees. Yankee Stadium. Yeah, in Yankee Stadium, uh, Dodgers outscored them 17 to 10. Um, what has stood out about these two teams thus far is uh, not chasing pitches out of the zone and reaching base via the walk. Uh, the Yankees have a 24.4 percent chase rate throughout the postseason, and the Dodgers have a 25.1 percent. Uh, chase rate throughout the postseason the league average uh, throughout this postseason is 29.9 percent so both are um, at least four percentage points below that Um, also the Yankees and Dodgers have the two highest expected Wobas and walk rates among the 12 teams um, throughout the playoffs Uh, so yeah that includes even the teams that only played two games and they have um, higher expected Wobas than all of them which is basically the um you know, the underlying thing of, you know, a good combination of strikeout rate, walk rate, and quality of contact, quality of contact. you know, hitting the ball hard and also having, you know, line drives and, uh, you know, competitive fly balls. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, I also appreciate that, uh, like, after two years of speculating against the uh, the new playoff format, that we get the two number one seeds. Yeah, it is refreshing. I, th- I think... I think like, is... we don't I don't think we should ever have to have a conversation about like the buy or anything else like that ever again. And because, all... you know, because the Dodgers, especially like they very easily could have lost either of these two series. I'm not going to say the same about the Yankees, but I mean, the Dodgers were down two games to one of the Padres. You know, they were they did. They were a lot more commanding over the Mets. But, you know, I think the the, the idea like the scenario where the Mets came back in that series and won, you know, could have been planted there certainly more than the Yankees in their two series. 
Yeah. And, and to add to that, these were the two least dominant uh, com combination of one seeds that we've had yes, in a very long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, I mean, and one of them, you know, had played 500 ball for the last like four months of the season and could have easily been overtaken by a, a more streaky team. Exactly. Yeah. Which and, they didn't, they didn't exactly play, you know, neither team the Yankees played was exactly uh, on exa on quite a hot streak for some amount of time either, but regardless, I mean, yeah. they, you know, they did exactly what they were supposed to do against objectively inferior competition. Yeah. So it's not a matter of, oh, these teams were just especially good this year and and broke through the bye. I mean, the Dodgers two years mm -hmm. ago had 111 wins. Yeah. Um, And, uh, and they just happened to lose that series. Uh, whereas, yeah, this year, you know, you got a 98 win team versus a 94 win team. Um, So, so yeah, I don't think it was just, they were so dominant that they, that they broke through the mold. No, I think, uh, I think just, yeah, that buy thing, there was some good, good fortune had on some of those wildcard teams early on. It's just it, the fact that it happened for, um, in the first time in that format made things, you know, look a little bit worse. Um, so yeah, that, that part is fun. Um, uh, any, anything else that you're looking at with this, uh, with this series? Yeah, I don't want to bore too, people too much with the narratives that, you know, you've already heard, right? It's the 12th time that they're facing off. It's the Otani versus Judge. It's Soto versus Betts. It's, uh, you know, whatever. I'm excited to see. I think an underrated thing would be, uh, you know, Yamamoto in this series, right? I mean, you know, I know that he's been a bit on and off this year with the injuries. And even in the playoffs, he's had some good starts, some shaky starts. Uh, but I mean, you know, it was kind of between the Yankees and the Dodgers for him. I don't think he's going to pitch in Yankee stadium unless maybe they start him game one and he goes game five. Uh, but you know, it'll be interesting to see how he fares against that lineup. Did he, and he did face the Yankees in June, right? I feel like I, I remember forget. him doing that. Um, I think he was healthy. It was mm -hmm. one of his last, it was one of his last, um, he did. Yeah, he did great. Seven innings pitch, two hits, no runs, two walks, seven strikeouts in a two to one win. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is that is a that is another thing because yeah, those were two of the favorites out there, um, as you mentioned. Uh so yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's cool. Like this series is historic, but it also hasn't happened since 1981. So it's not like anyone in our generation is tired of it I mean, say it's, probably... it's not like the uh, it's not like the warriors Cavs, yeah uh, the finals for for people our age yeah exactly like anyone who uh is tired of it i'm sure was was alive in the 1950s um or yeah very very present in baseball uh in the 1950s you know, how i mean was anyone in this series alive the last time they faced each other none of the players no i don't think I don't think there's Probably any 43 right. year olds on the team. Oh, definitely not. No. <laughs> um, Clayton Kershaw is 35. Yeah, he's or 36. People, yeah, Kershaw is younger than people realize because he made his debut at age 20. That's he's one not of my watching the series, unfortunately. But one of my favorite facts people throw out is that he and Degrom are the same age. I throw that out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, by people i think i meant you yes um, but uh i don't know how many other people i've heard say that but i've said it 700 times yeah it's a thing where i think since i've heard it from you i thought you I just assume that it's like a more yeah uh, commonly said thing yeah yeah um, did we want to did we want to get into predictions for this yeah let's get into some predictions uh i'll start with you chris what do you got in this series um, yeah, I think this is going to be very competitive. I think the teams are very even and there's not really anyone that has a particular advantage. Uh, I think, you know, both team, I, I don't think either team is necessarily fully complete. Um, I think each team has some holes. So I expect a very competitive series. I expect some fun games happening. Um, you know, I expect some, some solid offensive performances as well. Um, but I think ultimately the Dodgers take it in seven. Okay. Yeah. I have, uh, I I'm very curious to see a few things. One, I mean, you know, for a lot of these guys on the Yankees, it's going to be their first time in the world series, Aaron judge, uh, Garrett Cole's first time as a Yankee. 
Uh, Juan Soto's obviously first time as a Yankee. It's the first chance he's gotten. Um, John Carlos Stanton, it will be his first time entirely in the World Series. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of interesting things to look at and, uh, you know, how the moment is going to be for them. Whereas, you know, the Dodgers outside of Otani, pretty much all the established guys have been there before, um, except with the exception of like Teoscar Hernandez, uh, Yamamoto, Flaherty. Um, but I mean, you know, the Betts, the Freeman, the Smith, uh, they've all been there before. So, you know, I, I'm curious to see how the experience goes. I'm also very curious to see how the Dodgers handle uh, some things like, you know, pitching to Aaron Judge, pitching to Juan Soto, John Carlos Stanton, especially, right? Like Soto's, like I mentioned, the kind of guy where you watch him in the box and you just can't picture a scenario where he gets out. Uh, Stanton, where he has the potential to kill you in any in any given situation, like the, he is still, I think, somewhat vulnerable up there. So I'm curious to see how the Dodgers handle him. I'm curious to see if they can contain Aaron Judge the same way that the Royals and Guardians were able to. Um, I'm curious to see if the Yankees uh, pitching will be able to stop the Dodgers offense. Uh, I'm curious to see uh, who uh, does the, the walk rates uh, more. All right. If both teams continue with that, if there's a team that's able to limit that uh, ultimately uh, I'm going Dodgers in six. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It seems like that can, that can happen. They do have the home field advantage. They won uh they won four game, four more games than the Yankees this year. Um, and uh, who who won the uh, who won the All Star game this year? Not that it obviously uh, it was the uh, AL, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. So it would have been. So it would have been the Yankee Stadium. Yeah, if it was. Can you imagine if that rule didn't exist and we got like the, the the number one example I think of is always uh, twenty sixteen. Oh yeah, with that right because the Cubs were a much better team in terms of regular season record. But, like, I don't know, would Game 7 have had a ton of added value if it was at Wrigley? Um, I, well, like, if you... The answer is probably yes, because the Cubs would have walked off on a Miguel Montero single. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, like, the Davis home run, actually, the Davis home run wouldn't have been gone. Um, so, no. So, no, because it wouldn't have even gone to extras. Yeah, if you if everything happened the can you Can you same... check that? Is that data available? I'm going to do the, I'm going to have to click this back button so many times. Oh yeah. That'll does like, I don't even know if they actually have the tracking from 2016. You got to remember it was November, 2016, by the way, not October. Yeah. True. True. Uh, I believe it was the second. Yep. Eight, seven Cubs. Uh, do we have that data? Does it exist that far? It does. Uh, Oh shoot! Never mind. Okay, the Davis home run was gone in twenty nine out of thirty ballparks. Wait, what? Oh yeah, duh. It's okay. It's gone in twenty nine out of thirty ballparks. The one that it's not gone at is Fenway because Baltimore didn't exist in two thousand sixteen. I'm so conditioned when I see a left uh, a home run to left field that's gone in twenty nine out of thirty to think Baltimore, but no, it actually would have been probably in like the fiftieth row in Baltimore. All right, never mind. I'm wrong. That ball would have been gone in Wrigley. I kind of thought it wouldn't have been. Right, right. Yeah, no, uh that uh yeah, it it's it's crazy to think about yeah, the differences because yeah, that would have been an absolute crowd killer. Yeah. Um but also then, yeah. the the Miguel Montero single at the middle would right, have been yeah. crazy. I forgot that his that his was the first RB because people always uh I always see the highlight of the Zobris double, but I yeah, guess Yeah, but that oh that would have only kept the game tied. Um because oh yeah oh right yeah because right, right. uh davis hits another rbi right before the uh the mike the famous michael martinez ground out true yeah oh yeah no yep yeah i forgot to mm-hmm. flip-flop that yeah because the cubs so the cubs score two runs in the 10th the, the indians score one yeah so i mean if if the game was at wrigley and it played out the exact same way the indians would have oh my god it would have been the second time the indians were up with three outs to go in game seven and lost. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad it was in Cleveland. I, I don't want to put that on a franchise a second time. Yeah, absolutely. That's not and, fair. And uh, I guess we will leave you with that. Um, if you are, uh, 
Yeah, that does it for this installment of Above Replacement Radio. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and want to watch the conversation as it happens, go to the YouTube channel. It is called Above Replacement Radio. Check out all the guest interviews. It is organized in a playlist. We've had Jeff Pass and Chris Rose, Sarah Langs, Mike Petriello, Foolish Bailey, and Mark Simon on four times. Uh, so you can check all that out um, at the Above Replacement Radio YouTube channel. Also follow us on social media. Follow me on Twitter, Echoes underscore Gianta. Follow Daniel on both Twitter and Instagram at Daniel underscore Curran and follow the show Instagram at Above Replacement Radio for all the show needs. Uh, we hope you enjoy this one and we hope to see you next time where we'll be talking about some of these World Series games that have happened. Uh, we will see you then. This conversation. This conversation is over. Is over. <laughs>